Okay, so in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, we have uh, part of, of, of the scripture teaching about uh, a flesh and blood Jesus. And I think that's very important. I think it's very important to think about that and, and, and maybe particularly just now. Because I don't know about you, but I, I often ask the question, well, who can, who can possibly understand God? Um, he, he is so far away from my everyday existence. Um, at, at every level, you know, and, and that makes him difficult to understand. He's eternal, and I'm not. He's he's invisible, and I, I can't see him. Uh, he he sees everything, that, and I I can't. He knows everything. Uh, I, I certainly don't. He even knows my thoughts when I'm lying in bed at night, and that's a weird and quite a scary thing uh, to to have to think about someone who knows us at that thought level of our lives. Um, he's not created. He has always existed. He's always right. He's always good. He's the source of all life. He, he doesn't change. He's not like us at that level. And uh, he exists everywhere. Um, but uh, beyond his creation, uh, he, and he's personal. He's a, he's a spirit, but he's, he's personal. Um, and he's, he's separate then from his creation. He exists outside the 100 billion galaxies that have so far been discovered in this uh, universe. And he understands at the other level, I kind of mentioned this the other week, one of the, the 30 trillion cells that each person has, uh, with each cell containing uh, the 3 billion DNA base pairs making up the human genome. I hope you're impressed with my knowledge there. Uh, and that's that's that begins to help us to uh, recognize how beyond our understanding God is, uh, and yet we are image bearers of God, and um, we're made for Him, we're spiritual beings, but we're not made to be Him, we're made for Him, and, and we're made to be accountable to Him, and I think. If you summarise the, the the genesis of sin, it's it's where it all went wrong, isn't it? It's where it all went wrong when uh, when when we moved from uh, being made for Him to wanting to be Him. Uh, the, the seed of sin is wanting to be like God, not in the created image way that we were, but to be like God in who God was and his glory and his power. We wanted to be equal with God. Humanity wanted that. And in many ways, sin, even in our own lives uh, now, is has that, that core reality. It's an overreaching into uh, something that is not is not possible for us to, to be. I'm a bit of a hasher when it comes to um, DIY, not great. And I've got great, great ideas of what I could do with DIY, but quite often um, I'll overreach myself and I'll take on something that's far beyond my ability to do. And I'm much better at destroying things than actually building and, 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 and creating things. Um, but in a sense, a million times um, more than that is what we've done with God is that we've completely overreached as human beings uh, and tried to uh, take God's place. Uh, we, we, we want to be Lord of our lives. Uh, I want to decide what's right and wrong. I want to be a judge. And, you know, we see that coming, coming across so much in our lives. We want to take it control. And uh, even if I muck up, uh, I want to be the one who is in control of my life. We push God off the throne, uh, we reject him, and we choose not to believe him. And uh, in a sense, that's the, the core reality of, of where we are. Uh, but the trouble with that is, uh, in the world in which we live, we, we're not able to control our destiny in the way that uh, we've been deceived to believe that we can. Uh, we're, we can't be sovereign. Uh, we see that all the time, whether it's with illness or with COVID just now, or with, it, with, with death, whether it's post-death or, uh, uh, sorry, pre-birth pre or post-birth. Uh, 
whether it's with unrequited love or uh, whether it's being made redundant or being opposed by people or restrictive laws in the society in which we live. There's a million things every day that expose our overreach, uh, trying to be what we can't be. Um, and we recognize our vulnerability and our brokenness and our sin. And the response to that so often uh, in our day-to-day -day living, I think is, is threefold very quickly, is rage, is anger uh, and frustration and, and maybe just denial. So very often um, this lack of ability to be God or to be like God in our lives it uh, makes us very angry uh, with life. Uh, we see it very much just now. Well, we see it always in society and we see it in our own hearts, but we see it with a lot with key, keyboard warriors, don't we? We blame. There's always someone to blame for our inability to live the way we want to live. And it may be leaders, it may be family, or in our families, it may be our boss, it may be drivers on the road or uh, cyclists or pedestrians at a kind of trivial level. It may be the incompetence of other people or it may be God himself. We're angry and we blame and we blame and we blame all the time. Um, and I wonder if sometimes we reflect on our anger and when we, when we, when we display anger in for, as a response, what that's saying about us and what it's saying about uh, why we want to be in control and, and why we often blame God for uh, what is happening in our lives. So it can be rage or it can also be frustration. Uh, and we're often frustrated in life because we, we, we make really bad gods. We're, we're not good gods. And so we're often frustrated. We don't understand what's happening. Um, we crave kind of that independence that would allow us to do what we want and the control. But then sometimes even when we get that independence and control, well, life just sucks anyway. And there's always that shadow of impermanence uh, attacking us. Or we can just be in denial. You know, we can suppress the reality of God and uh, just almost forget that whole reality and, and not face up to him and just live uh, in a kind of shallow existence, happy enough, trying to make a difference, judging ourselves by our own standards. Um, and many in the world do that, hoping that it'll all turn out in the end okay. Uh, ignoring death uh, as an enemy as if it'll never happen. And just, we can even do that as believers. Stop praying, stop growing, stop obeying, and just live in a kind of um, shallow uh, neutrality, as it were. And all of that, these issues, these problems, I think, that we face stem from us, stem from our sinful desires to try and be God, to try and be in control and try and almost ignore him um, and uh, ignore his reality because we, maybe we don't understand him or he's just, uh, it's impossible for us to grasp uh, what it would be like to be God. And I think, I do believe that's why we need a flesh and blood God. That's why we need Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. In verse 14, I'm going to look at 14 uh, to the end um, uh, that section. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. So, and that, that same things are flesh and blood. Uh, and the Bible continually reminds us that if we're going to understand God, then we needed him to become flesh and blood in order for us to understand. So there's something uniquely expressive in the nature of God through the incarnation. When Jesus became flesh, uh, Jesus becoming flesh makes him uh, uh, someone, God, it makes him a God that we can understand. It reveals him, it glorifies him in a way that nothing else could ever have done. It's the only way he could have expressed his grace, his sacrificial love, and his commitment to redeem us, to save us. Uh, it's the crucified God is the greatest revelation of the supernatural character of God and helps us to understand him in our lives. So it helps us understand. And um, he, we needed a flesh and blood God to redeem us, to bring us back from uh, a lost eternity and from the effects of sin and what sin was 
and what sin is and what sin does in our lives. Angels couldn't do that. Uh, Jesus, the title of this address is Jesus is no angel. Angels uh, don't cut it. Uh, it's not good enough for a spiritual being to have come and told us about God uh, as, as the only way. Uh, angels themselves are a, a bit mysterious and separate from us and uh, they're not like us, they're not image bearers, they're not sovereign, they're not, uh, they're not like God, they're not sovereign, they're infinite and they're not eternal. They're servants uh, who are sent uh, to uh, uh, serve those who believe. But Jesus was no angel and uh, I'm going to try and be a little bit theological for a moment here. Um, it's impossible for us to be gods, okay? It's impossible for us to be God and to be human. God alone can be God and human. And that, that's the deep mystery of both having God, Jesus having a divine nature and a human nature. Um, he alone uh, can be God in the flesh. And it, he shows us what we need to see, Um the only way we could grasp the character of God and his love and his worthiness is by seeing Jesus, is by coming to know and understand Jesus. Jesus is God translated into our language. Jesus is, is God that we can um, come to know, uh, not only in his life, but through his work. Because he's come to, he has come to show us God, but also to set us free from sin's great companion, which is fear. In verse 15, it says, he came that we might destroy the power, the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And that's the, the great reality of not having God in our lives is that we live uh, with great fear, a fear of not being in control, a fear of uh, the future, a fear of failure, a fear of rejection, uh, a fear of not meeting uh, somebody's standard, whether it's in a marriage or in a uh, workplace or whatever it might be, and, and fear of the future and fear of judgment and fear of death. He came to release us and free us from that because of his great work. Uh, all the, all the, uh, uh, all the outworking of sin in our lives he came to redeem us from. And he could only do that by becoming the God man, becoming Jesus, Jesus Christ, a flesh and blood God. Um, we make miserable flesh and blood gods. We can't do it. We, we simply can't save ourselves by claiming God's throne. But he left his throne to open up the way back for us to be truly human, made in God's image, but not trying to become God's. So the exercise of God becoming flesh requires God emptying himself of his glory. It involves humility. It involves servanthood. It involves obedience. It involves controlled power. It involves, amazingly, hiding his glory. Um, Philippians 2 speaks a lot about that, and you can read that at your leisure. And so the interesting thing is the only way we can see God's glory is if God hides his glory, if he veils his glory. Philippians 2 speaks about that. And there's, so that's the remarkable truth is the only, the only way we can grasp, begin to grasp the glory of God in Jesus is because God has hidden his glory because it's beyond us to grasp unless it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's uh, an astonishing reality. If you ever get time to read a short, small book, uh, that's an old book by a man that I 
knew briefly as a boy. It's called The Cross in the Experience of Our Lord by R.A. Finlayson. He used to be a professor in the Free Church College. And it has got a marvelous insight into the person of Jesus and uh, him being a flesh and blood Jesus. Our longing for being self-sovereign, for wanting all the glory without God, it destroys us, absolutely destroys us because we are human. The only person that could live out the glory of God as a human being is the person, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And only as we see Jesus Christ, the veiled glory of God in Jesus Christ, and put our trust in him, are we able to reflect the glory of God in our lives as we were created to do? So only God can become a God-man. Christ took on flesh and blood. He had to. He had to become one of us. He was conceived. He spent nine months in the, in the womb. He was a newborn. He was a toddler. He had to learn to talk and to walk and to read, he, to understand fa family dynamics. He had brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles. He worked. He made friends and he lost friends. He knew grief and loss and he, he became dependent. He was misunderstood. He was hungry and well fed. He was thirsty and his thirst was slaked. He was poor, he was cold, he was naked, he was clothed, he was hated, he was loved, he suffered, he was tempted. He laughed, he cried, he slept, he got up and he went to bed. Why? Because he had to become flesh and blood. Because only a God-man can die. God can't die in heaven. God as a spirit can't die. Only God in the flesh can die. And there was no other way for us to live and have death defeated except for Jesus, except for God to pay the price. And in order for God to pay the price, he had to become a human being to die. He had to have flesh and blood. And that's the astounding reality of the cost and the commitment of Jesus to you and to me. He's perfect, yet he is punished in death. For, grasp, for our grasping at sovereignty and our, our trying to replace him in our lives. As we rejected God, God the Father rejected Jesus in our place. He's rejected by the infinite and he's rejected by all on the cross. God, the creator of all life and the person of his son is crucified. And only God, only God can defeat death, as it says, and, and, the, uh, and the power of death in the devil. Only God can do that. And only God can be raised to a new life uh, for a humanity that tried themselves to become God or like God in the wrong way. And because he's raised from the dead, we can become like God in the right way as image bearers and uh, that is how we were designed to live and for you and me that re reflects uh, overwhelming and sacrificial love beyond anything that we can ever experience and if you're tempted to give up on your faith in Jesus Christ I simply ask you to fix your eyes on Jesus this flesh and blood saviour whose glory was veiled so that we could see it and who becoming flesh and blood was able to die and was able to redeem. It couldn't have happened any other way. Therefore, because he himself has suffered when tempted and becoming flesh, 
he is able to help those who are tempted. So I close just by asking these questions. Today, in your own experience, what temptations do you face? Um, and I don't know what they'll be, but know that he is able to help you because he is a flesh and blood saviour, because of the incarnation. You know, what is it? Are you tempted to be hugely selfish? Am I tempted to be hugely selfish? Uh, and not to consider others and not to love God or love others. Well, he knows that. He's been tempted in that way and has overcome. He is able to help us. He tempted to be proud because we find humility tough. He knows. He's experienced that. He's able to help us when we're tempted to overcome. He tempted to go your own way. It's much easier, isn't it? Especially maybe just now to reject God or to reject his word and to struggle and find obedience impossible. He knows he's been tempted. And yet he's able because he's overcome these things because he was tempted without sin. You angry, going back to what I said at the beginning, or frustrated or living in denial. You angry at others or at God or at lockdown. He's able, just one day at a time, he is able. Frustrated that so much is out of our control. Frustrated at your health or frustrated at your situation. He knows because he's a flesh and blood saviour, he is able. And it's the great temptation just to live in denial. Maybe just like everyone else seems to be living and to turn your back. And I just encourage you tonight to fix your eyes on Jesus. Yeah, that's all we can do during this pandemic. We, much has been struck back from us, but he is this great flesh and blood saviour and he is able. And uh, remember that and know his power and his resurrection glory in your life. We're going to look at a lot of different aspects of his life and why he is such a suitable saviour and why this is the only way it could have been for us. I'm going to pray. Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand and know what it means uh, to, to begin to grasp uh, a flesh and blood saviour. We sing about a lot of great words that we were singing there earlier. We, um, we talk about it a lot at Christmas time in the incarnation, but to think of God becoming flesh as being the only way that we could know God because of our sin and our rebellion, the only way we could begin to understand God and uh, have a, a God who could save us by um, paying the price for satisfying God's uh, own uh, anger against our sin and being a propitiation and atonement for us by his blood. He had to have blood. He had to have a body. And we rejoice that he has a glorified body now and is real and is interceding for us today. Help us to see that more clearly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.